podcast i speak to dr ulas current who was one of the earliest and leading tiger biologists in india we speak about his illustrious career and center for wildlife studies an ngo he established almost 40 years ago in 1984 welcome dr ulas current pleasure to have you on the podcast here my pleasure my first question is what got you interested in conservation uh i was i wasn't aware of conservation in the mid 50s i was born in 1948 so i was primarily interested in watching birds and nature i had a in born fascination for nature but so extraordinarily spectacular landscape with a lot of wildlife it was all being hunted hunted out forests were being cleared logged i'm talking of 60s and 70s, 50s and 60s so that's when i got interested in conservation so ever since then i've been both a wildlife naturalist and a conservationist so what was the idea behind creating center for wildlife studies in 1984 that came much later uh i had um, i had got an engineering degree in 1971 in fact i have written about a lot of this in my new book among tigers which is out there available fairly widely in uk us so you know it may be of interest to whoever is watching this show uh, so basically i got an engineering degree graduated with engineering in 71 but right from nine, early 1960s i was going into the forest trying to watch while i was trying to watch tigers but they were almost on the verge of extinction being wiped out pretty rapidly so and i got into engineering just to earn some living but it didn't interest me so i was still wandering in the forest often cutting classes and things like that so when i was in second year of engineering i read dr george charles article in life magazine uh, um, about his tiger research we had just concluded in kana so i was fairly determined from that point of time that i would be i would like to be a wildlife biologist and uh, not an engineer uh, this was in 1966 it took me a long time it took me nearly 20 years before would get there because i did other things like i worked as an engineer i sold farm equipment i farmed but all through i was a naturalist so in in 1984 by then i knew that i had to write publish i had to read i had to understand i was fairly well read but you know not without a formal degree so i i wanted to do a survey of lion tail macaques in the western ghats and uh, i knew there were large populations although all the primatologists in general uh, believed they were extinct in karnataka and very rare in further south so to do that research project i need an institution so i started this small ngo called center for wildlife studies in 1984 some of your most notable research work was the use of camera traps in population density estimation of large mammals in india so could you talk about your work in this regard yeah one of the key things in conservation is you you conservation is about animal populations it's not about so much about individual animals and how they feel and how kindly disposed you are towards them and those kind of things conservation is about three things if a species is going in decline you want to recover it if a species is useful some species are hunted or harvested as in fisheries and sometimes even with game animals in different situations and occasionally when a species turns harmful to human interest you may want to eliminate individuals or sections of the population so all of it revolves around populations so my interest in tigers goes back to that 1966 article of george shuller perhaps even earlier when i read jim corbett and all that so it was very clear to me that uh, the methods that were being developed to count tigers or prey animals were 
non-scientific because they were generated by a bureaucracy, not by any science. So when I was a graduate student in Florida, uh, getting my degree in wildlife, I chose as my focal area how to estimate numbers of prey animals and numbers of tigers accurately. That's how I got interested in this. And for the prey, I adopted a method called line transect sampling, which had been developed a few decades earlier, but had never been applied in India. So I started applying it in 1986. And for tigers, um, the camera, cheap camera traps had come in. I had tried camera traps earlier, but they were expensive and we need large numbers of camera traps to actually survey populations. So when relatively cheaper camera traps came, I started working with them. It soon became clear to me that camera pictures alone won't give you estimates. And just like in line transit sampling, you had to have statistical modeling underlying these photographic exercise. So you could relate your sample data and estimate what you did not sample or the wider population. So that's how I combined the camera traps and line traps. Um, uh, and uh, capture recapture sampling and started working on those issues. So recently, the Indian government published the 2022 Tiger Census, and India's tiger population has, has increased to over 3,000, which, mm. which is a substantial increase from 2006. So uh, what is your opinion about this, and what has India done well in terms of tiger conservation? The second is a different question. The first one is all these numbers are meaningless. They are derived using very flawed methods and sometimes even manipulation of numbers. So the first point to remember is this 3000 itself is not a huge number. India has 380,000 square kilometers of tiger forest and potentially it can hold 10 to 15,000 tigers just in that area, forest area. The country is 3 million square kilometers. There's a lot more space. But I'm talking of the government-owned forest. So 3,000 is no big number. And generally, um, uh, the, the claimed growth rates, etc., are based on the survey they did in 2006. The first survey using what they called the revised methodology of national tiger estimation. Before that, in 2002, they had said there were 3,600 tigers. Nobody remembers all this. So they set the number very low, changed the methodology so that they could get some room to play with, keep on adjusting these numbers and making tall claims. But this methodology that they use has been severely criticized by scientists. There has never been a proper scientific repertoire in any journal. So I don't pay any credence to these numbers. That is the first point. Second point, uh, you know, how much India has done or have we done well or not is a slightly different question. Uh, I think the, uh, as I said, the what is potentially possible now, given it's India's space and economic resources and uh, capacity, is more like 10 to 15,000 tigers. So gloating about 3,000 is just absurd. But did we fail totally? No, I completely don't agree. Uh, I think the tigers were really in decline in the early 60s. And by early 70, 1970s, they, were, they would have gone extinct, but for the effort India put in. So this was primarily because of Mrs. Gandhi's leadership also, the forest department's hard work. The forest department used to be a very military-style enforcement agency and also pressure from conservationists, first-generation conservationists. So this remarkable recovery took place not everywhere. It took place in some places. And the new strong law called the Wildlife Protection Act and the Project Tiger, which identified some areas for tiger recovery, in some of them, the tigers came back. And that was an incredible, almost unbelievable to me what was accomplished. This was primarily between 1972 and 1992, the first two decades, perhaps even the first three decades. So certainly there was, India did a terrific job at that time. 
and compare to any other country because similar efforts were undertaken in all other tiger range countries. Nepal succeeded to some degree. They had a parallel recovery of tiger populations in Chitwan and one or two places. But all other countries, literally, uh, several of them lost tigers. Tigers became extinct. And even now, if you look at it, comparatively, India and Nepal have done better. Uh, recently, more recently, Thailand has, has been doing a good job. But overall, it is, you know, we have done better than others, but certainly it's not something that we claim as unique or the most wonderful thing we have done. There's a tendency on the bureaucracy to ride on the hard work of previous generations. I would say from 2005, we have not lived up to what our capacity was at all. We have been just throwing money and uh, the results have been pretty pathetic. So you had mentioned that India has about 380,000 square kilometers of potential tiger habitat, but only 20% of that habitat actually has sustainable populations of tigers. So why is there so much tiger habitat without sustainable tiger densities? I would say even 20, see 20% 20 works out to 76,000 square kilometers. Uh, probably even that's a higher estimate. And the reason is very simple. It's the same reasons why tigers were about to go extinct even in these 70,000 square kilometers or 50,000 square kilometers. Number one is the loss of uh, uh, expansion of agriculture. That's the biggest culprit for decline in tiger habitats. Now in this 380,000 square kilometers, there is continued loss of erosion of forests because of the loosening of the strict protection laws, ushering in of the Forest Rights Act. This has led to, at one point, uh, the erosion of the forest base had stopped. Now, after 2006, that has begun again. So there is nibbling away of the habitat itself. Uh, the second thing is, in many areas, there is unrestricted human use, cattle grazing, um, collection of firewood, and all these sorts of pressures which were which had to be removed before tigers could come back thirdly hunting hunting although it's not it's come down drastically in the areas that, where you see some wildlife protection it's still very strong in states like chhattisgarh jharkhand and in the northeastern hill states hunting of prey prey animals primarily so all these factors are there if you start improving your protection, bringing a greater proportion of the area and the stricter protection as time goes by, gradually you can increase that area and build up the population. But if you just spend money only on the existing high density populations, which is what they're doing, it's unlikely that we'll be able to do anything better. So one of the prominent challenges with um, di tiger conservation is human tiger conflict. So do you think human-tiger coexistence is possible and what are some long-term solutions to mitigate human-tiger conflict? I think when you say coexistence is possible or not, it depends on the scale at which you are asking the question. If you are saying, can people and tigers coexist in India? Certainly. Can they exist in the state of Karnataka? Certainly. Can they exist in the state of uh, district of Mysore? Certainly. So as you come down in scale, then if you ask me if there's a viable population of maybe half a dozen tigresses and one sanctuary, if there can be viable coexistence at that level, I would say no. It's possible at these wider scales. So there you need separate spaces for uh, tigers and separate spaces for human beings and their legitimate aspirations for development. We can't have conservation by denying development to people. But the only thing is you can't have development and conservation in the same space at the same time. Early in the interview, you, you mentioned problem animals. So there's been a lot of controversy in India in regards of handling man-eaters and um, other such animals. So what are your opinions about how man-eater tigers or leopards should be handled? There are two issues here. See, we have to remember the conflict that we see is a price we are paying for success. 
when you have tiger and leopard populations increasing, these are animals with very high productivity. Once their populations reach high densities, they are territorial species. You can't go on, pack them in higher and higher. There's a limit to which you can pack them in. For example, for tigers, it may be some 10, 15 tigers per 100 square kilometers for leopards, maybe a little more. But beyond that, you can't compress these populations into the same space. Yet the in, number of tigers or leopards being born is much higher than the numbers that die naturally in fights or starvation or whatever. So periodically, this gives rise to surpluses, local surpluses. And in these contexts, you have these animals that become problem animals. These are typically either young animals trying to find new territories or they are old animals that have been evicted from territories. For the most part, there may be exceptions, but by and large. So these categories animals come into conflict with human interests because they can't be in these secure areas preying on wild prey. Where they have livestock available, they take livestock. Even if there is wild prey, prey there, they'll take livestock because livestock are easier to catch. So that is how the conflict starts usually, with livestock killing. And not all livestock killers become man-eaters. The vast majority of them are still afraid of people. So they keep, kill livestock and people poison them. And sometimes if the government compensates people quickly and fairly, even that problem so, at least mitigates. Uh, the real problem starts. Uh, then there is another situation where people commonly use the term man-eating, which again is wrong which is when a tiger or a leopard is in a confined situation, like it's entered a cattle shed or a um, coffee estate and it's surrounded by mobs of people. Now, what happens is it can't escape. So when people mob it, come closer to it, uh, trying to throw rocks or doing whatever, chase it away, that is when it, it becomes aggressive and it may maul people and kill people. Again, these tigers or leopards are not man-eaters. They are still terrified of people and those kind of animals escape from the mob if they escape. They will not stalk human beings. In fact, their re human fear of humans it gets reinforced. So what are these man-eaters? These are not these animals that are occasionally mauling people or in trying to escape or getting cornered. These are animals that have lost their natural fear of human beings. Most tigers are terrified of human beings on foot. When you see a tiger in Kana or Ranthambur from a gypsy or a... That's different because they are, they are tolerating the presence of the vehicle, which they see as no threat. But if you get down from the vehicle, they'll run. Now, the man-eater is very different. It has, for whatever reason, either it's starvation or it's incapacitated or because it's uh, somehow lost the fear of human beings by watching another tiger, its parent perhaps hunting humans or some reason. Once they lose the fear of natural fear of human beings, they become extremely cunning and they stalk human beings just like uh, they stalk other prey animals. And this is a very small fraction of the animals. It's not that every tiger is a man-eater. The only area where this behavior is perhaps more wide, widespread than a tiny fraction is Sundarbans, where tigers have not been harassed and hunted for years. So there, there, there's the perhaps an occasional man-eater is more common than in other areas. But these animals have to be eliminated. There is no other solution for that. You can't take them and put them in zoos. You can't, you know... You can't reform them. Uh, so these problem animals have to be quickly eliminated. And a linked issue is when you introduce tigers from captivity or from same situations where unfamiliar, often they become man-eaters. So in that process, you are creating man-eaters. But with all this, I want you to look at it slightly differently. More tigers, more, uh, more human beings die getting killed by feral street dogs, then they are by tigers. Yet we are feeding hundreds of thousands of dogs, giving them banana, uh, you know, bread, uh, treating them like cute friends and letting them roam and maul poor people's children. 
so you know when you you are tolerating it in bangalore city four or five people are killed by dogs every year why are you cribbing about some 10 15 people killed across india all of india by tigers so i, I think there's an unfairness in picking it on tigers it's because of the nature of the big cat uh, people tend to believe they are more dangerous than elephants for example elephants kill 500 human beings in india compared to tigers a dozen or a couple of dozen by tigers so i think partly it is psychological we have to view it very rationally but i'm completely opposed to animal welfare is so oppose shooting or killing of confirmed maniters once a habituated maniter stocks killing people one two three you can't wait you can't reform you can't keep photographing it you need to shoot it you have also been a big supporter of the voluntary resettlement of villages outside protected areas. So why is this the case and what are some of the main challenges in a village res resettlement? No, the biggest need is this. Uh, traditionally, rural, particularly forest dwelling rural people, lived... Uh, had very short expectation of life and birth. Their expectation of consumption were very low. Their life expectancy was low. They lived in dire poverty. They lived off the forest through logging or hunting or in some manner. Now what has happened is uh, India, uh, the population, uh, not only have population densities gone up, survival expectation of life has increased from 32 years to 64 years. So people are living longer. People want a better life. They are not uh, prepared to live uh, on starvation diets and suffering diseases and lacking medicine, lacking schools for their children, lacking transportation. Uh, see, this, this deprivation is often glorified by people as uh, some exalted state of spiritual existence. I don't believe that. Ordinary common people want... Uh, things have dramatically improved in India for people uh, compared to whatever people say the reality is our per capita income our health our life expectancy uh, have all improved with development so these people in remote areas are denied that development and there are uh, and given that we have only 3% or 4% of the land in which wildlife is now confined to which is the reserve forest the other 96% is free for all. So it is important that we don't take development there. I think it's important that we attract them through development outside. This is happening naturally. The proportion of rural forest dwelling people has declined in India significantly from about 80% at the time of independence to about 55% now. And this is an economic demographic phenomena. So it's very conducive now if you offer people opportunities for better education, schools, transportation, handholding, because some of them may not know agriculture. So if you give this support, people are voluntarily willing to come now. You don't have to force anybody. People are willing to come. In the parks I have worked, like Kudramuk and Nagarhole, there are 300, 400 families standing on tiptoes, ready to go if somebody can help them go out and settle so and that's the only way we can save this three percent from fragmentation and i also see it as a win-win solution uh, because people also benefit from this it is there are challenges because i see the challenge mainly as uh, the people who should be really focusing and doing this are agencies working with tribal development human development health care education these are large agencies. Some are a part of the government, uh, like the government has departments that take care of this. As well as in the NGO sector, there are very strong, very committed NGOs who are capable of doing this resettlement. But unfortunately, uh, the NGO sector, development NGOs, don't even look at this issue. They want people to stay in the forest and they want to deliver development there. To me, that's... That's first of all, it's it's the death knell for conservation. Secondly, their goodwill and talent should be used for the win-win solution or the right solution. So to me, that is the problem. 
the other problem is if the government alone tries to do it, particularly the forest department. Forest department is least equipped to do. Uh, it's a law enforcement agency. Don't They usually don't have empathy for people. And even if they have, they don't know exactly how to do it. They tend to do things in a ham-handed way. So the real importance is for uh, conservation and development NGOs to get involved, uh, work with the government agencies to make relocation work. We have done that in a few places, but it's not easy. You need the right kind of officials. You need the right kind of NGOs. You need a lot. It, it takes 20 to 30 years of hard work to make it work in a place, 10, 15 years. And unless you are willing to invest that time and you have the energy and passion for it, it's hard to make it work. But it's much easier than, than when we did it in the 90s because there was so much resistance. People were uncertain of their future. Now they are seeing development everywhere and people are ha quite willing to come out now. You mentioned that India can have between 10 to 15,000 tigers. So how do you think India can achieve this and what do you think is the way forward for tiger conservation in this country? See, basically, as I said, there is 380,000 square kilometers. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, a quarter of that or something like that, if you can bring up uh, 100,000 square kilometers, you are already talking, you know, 10 tigers, let's say, per square kilometer. You're talking about 10,000 tigers. So... It's not an un, un. We have to increase the fraction under strict protection. That's the key. Instead of pumping more and more money into the same areas, we should spread the money so other good areas where tigers can be recovered can be recovered. That's really the key. It's a budgetary uh, priority issue. And the bureaucracy is very reluctant to do that because they like spending money in the same place for multiple reasons. So this is something they have to be forced to do. They will not do it on their own. Second thing is relocation particularly is critical because if you don't relocate in many places, the development will come in, highways will come in, uh, dams will come in and the place will be finished. Now, relocation is painful and it's very, you know, it, although it requires a lot of money, uh, it all goes to beneficiaries. It doesn't go to the parts of the bureaucracy or some contractor or some third party. So people are reluctant to do it for that reason also. So I see three things as key. First is in areas where hunting is rampant, that has to be stopped. Number two, we have to, where possible, voluntary relocation has been taken up on a much bigger scale. These are the two things. And we have to increase the protected area network. Our protected areas, all forests are roughly 10 to 15% of India's area. Only about 4% of India's area is under protection. That has to be increased. So this is with the land we already have under government control. But there's another option for increasing wildlife habitats, not just for tigers, even for bustards and many other threatened species. This is by shifting lands where which are under agriculture to wildlife tourism this has happened in africa this has happened in other countries the key is economics people will not do it without uh, financial incentives so if one someone is growing ragi and instead if there's wildlife tourism in his land and he makes more money from that he will switch this is the reason why people change land use and crops. I think there are there's tremendous potential for that also. Not everywhere, but in specific situations. Because we have a 400 million strong middle class population. We have an Indian tourism. We don't depend on forest tourists anymore. There's a tremendous amount of money. People willing to spend money to watch wildlife. We have to leverage the economic power of tourism to really expand habitats outside of the government. These are sort of like private conservancies, cooperative societies under some other framework. So people own the land on which the animals come and they get a share of the profit. So I think there are many potential avenues. But for doing all this, we have to take conservation out of the clutches of the bureaucracy. We have to have a 
broader way to do conservation than just uh, expecting and giving uh, the forest department to do everything that that had a role but it's that role is kind of now diminishing we have to come up with other kinds of innovations so can you talk a bit about your book among tigers among tigers is uh, it sort of basically covers the experience I had from the time I, I was a schoolboy in this large landscape in southwestern India, uh, Malinard landscape, which had probably less than 70, 80 tigers to perhaps 300 plus, 300 to 350 tigers now, which was quite contrary to what I expected when I was a schoolboy. I thought tigers will go extinct. I didn't expect their numbers to increase five times. And it has happened despite. Uh, and uh, agricultural wages going up by 30 percent, life expectancy doubling, people roughly becoming three times richer in some sense, a lot of development which has had its negative consequences also. But overall, the tigers have come back in the face of all this development. So in that book, I talk about two or three things. One is what it was like in the past. And then I talk about my my interest is conservation uh, is science. I am very interested in studying animals, watching animals. That's what drew me to it. A uh, significant part of the book is about my experience with tigers, catching them, radio tracking them, following them, counting them using cameras, uh, these kind of natural history. Uh, then the very hard issues of protecting parks against pressures and uh, the kind of incidents that took place where, uh, you know, it was fairly dangerous to do conservation. And then in the last two chapters, uh, and also about how do you how do you deal with this? How do you motivate people? So what I did was, uh, um, in addition to publishing papers, I involved a lot of youth from local areas and got them engaged in conservation. And uh, some of them collected data and they continue to collect data, but a lot of them became grassroots conservationists. Some of them became my staff. So using this wider network, we were able to relocate 2,000 families with government assistance, but made the project schemes work. Uh, and then fought, fought some mining, uh, increased ratcheted up protection by putting pressure on the system as well as helping law enforcement. So it's a complicated story of almost all issues. But the, in summary, if this can happen in an area that has about 15% of India's tigers, perhaps this can happen in other places. So in the last two chapters, I give, I kind of laid, lay down what I have learned from all this experience. And uh, essentially, you need to protect nature, but you also need to decouple nature from human users. I think increasing use of nature is not a tool for conservation in India. It could be in Africa. It could be where numbers of human beings are very low. I'm not saying it's not a model that doesn't work. But for Asia, India, China, wherever all these densely populated countries, uh, extracting from nature is not a solution anymore. We have to decouple users from nature. and But that means you have to deliver what people want through advanced technologies, alternative technologies. So you don't use firewood, you use something else. You use, um, you, you know, you don't build big dams, you use nuclear power. These kind of alternatives that allow you to decouple human pressures from nature. And secondly, manage the land wisely so that parts of it is earmarked for conservation and other parts le for legitimate development. We can't deny development. I am... I, I don't see conservationists who oppose science and technology, advanced technologies, and people who say we don't need development. People need to um, bring down their expectations of a better life and people should consume less. Uh, I don't think these are going to work in a situation like India where the aspiration for development is very high among uh, common people. So I cover this ground briefly, but for an international audience in this book. There's a little bit of local politics and all, but broadly it's meant for uh, 
a wider audience. Talking about politics, what is your opinion about uh, cheetah reintroduction in India? Cheetah reintroduction, uh, restoring any species that was there once a part of the fauna and you want to bring it back, I think it's a very noble goal. In some sense, if you do it right, you're bringing back not just the charismatic animal, but all the associated fauna, the habitat, etc. There are many species that were a part of India. The Javan rhino was found in Sundarbans. Banting occurred more widely in India. And we had the brow antlered deer, now restricted to Manipur, was a part of Indian fauna. Uh, and so was the cheetah. So, <clears throat> in general, I'm in favor of bringing back any and all of these species, not just from outside, even the lion's range is now in one tiny population. It was found in half of North India at one time, the Asiatic lion. So there is range restoration needed within countries. The rhinoceros was found from Pakistan to Kaziranga in the Tarai belt. Now it's restricted to two, three poppies. So there is, this is a rewilding India, I think is a very, uh, very desirable goal. So I have no problem with the idea of bringing cheetah in. But it has to be driven by what we know about cheetah biology, what its ecological needs are. Uh, cheetahs live at extremely low densities, even in the best habitats in Africa. Uh, they need large territories. They need spaces between territories. And also they are dominated by other predators, lions, tigers, whatever else is there, leopards, wolves. So they are a very fragile species. All this boils down to requiring very large areas. And those large areas should have, should not have other large predators at high densities. It should have plenty of wild prey that the cheetah can catch, naturally born wild prey, not dumped from somewhere else. So there are very few sites in India where you can do that. Uh, I, I would say the only place where perhaps it could have been tried is the Rajasthan around Pokhran and Desert National Park. There are no other predators. There are huge populations of Chinkara and Gazelle because the local people, the Bishnois, don't kill or eat them. Uh, but even there, it would have been hard work. Uh, any Anywhere it would have involved a 20, 30 year effort to secure at least 10 to 15,000 square kilometers. That would have been the minimum size. So this is what is required. The, and the survival is very low. Some of the, of all tigers born, about 20% of the tigers reach breeding stage. In the cheetahs, that percentage is 5%. Most don't make it. It's a very fragile species. So without factoring all this, simply bringing cheetahs from Africa and dumping them in 700 square kilometers, which can probably hold four or five cheetahs and hope that will establish a viable population, I think it's really bad science. And it is driven by, I don't know what it is, the bureaucracy's desire for public. But what most peak conservationists don't realize is that this is not a new idea. This idea of dumping cheetahs in this manner was initiated in 2010 by the previous government. Unfortunately, when the government changed, the same bureaucracy who promoted it moved over to this government. So it's a bad idea. I opposed it in 2010 when the environment minister suggested it. I think I still say it's a bad idea. It won't work. It's as simple as that, you know for multiple reasons. It simply won't, if the goal is to, the Prime Minister talked very eloquently about establishing a wild population of cheetahs and them moving and settling down and creating more population. It's not going to happen with this model. Moving back towards your own career, so what has been some of your favorite memories from your conservation career? Well, the memories are, you know, interactions with wildlife are always memorable. Uh, I've, you know, I've been fortunate because for nearly 10 years, I literally lived in the forest, particularly when I was radio tracking tigers. I, I was with them all the time. And unlike these days when you can see some of these natural events of hunting and 
conflict etc at, at least in ranthambore and places like that where tigers have become very habituated it was very hard to see those things those days because i had callers i was able to see these kind of incidents so there's a certainly uh, they will always be in my memory and some of the uh, the network of young people who now are in their 40s and 50s who i put together they are doing active conservation in many locations so that gives me a sense of continuity i'm happy i played a role in their lives i also a uh, couple of things like the all these three places where i was involved heavily like nagarhole badra and kudremukh in pretty trashed condition when i went there in the 60s first so that's nearly 50 years ago and at that point if you had asked me i had no hope for them so obviously they have come back spectacularly and uh, to me that is not just makes me happy that that they came back that i had a role in it but to me more important is the lessons from these kind of recoveries are applicable if people learn from successes and stop doing stupid things copying previous failures like uh, this cheetah project dumping tigers in various places these are all you should learn from mistakes it doesn't work stop it so you know success is success breeds success so i'm i'm very happy about those particularly there is a giant mine that the network of conservation is shut down i'm not opposed to mining but this was asia's largest open cast mine in an area receiving 8000 mm of rainfall it was a disaster it was destroying agriculture wildlife everything that mine is gone and actually you see tigers on the mined area now so you know many of these things and particularly the relocation projects where people who are in dire poverty who barely had decent clothing to wear now drive around in maruti omnis and are you know wearing glares and going round i'm very happy that i had some role in improving their lives you know and some of the tribal boys who were agitating against me initially now they are prosperous agriculturists mid-aged farmers and some of us, the most sought after job is being a driver bulldozer driver that gets you a lot of income and prestige so i'm happy i've had a role in all this it's nice the mine you were talking about is the kudremukh mine right yeah uh, so what have been some of the biggest challenges you have faced during your conservation career challenges were when you try to it's not just me i was supporting law enforcement conservation is don't get involved they stay away and sometimes even they say there is no law enforcement needed which i simply don't agree so i was supporting law enforcement so often the anger of the mobs that burnt my car or my lab or burnt the forest was not necessarily directed against me but ag- against a group of us which included sincere officials and en- enforcing the law so those were very violent times uh, you know there was real threats then uh, my research because i was somewhat critical of government policies now my research was has always been hampered by not consistently particularly when a bad bureaucrat or a bad, bad politicians come one of their instinct was to try to stop my research so i had to go and fight cases in courts many many times to get back in and continue my research so that was the other hurdle uh what else i mean those are and uh, in a hurdle in the sense that there is uh, there is an intellectual hurdle you know i am i am making some propositions which uh, conservation is find hard to accept that we have to rely on modern technology to solve these problems a lot of people don't believe that they think by going back in time you can solve it so these are intellectual problems so they are stimulating they are not problems per se but they are hurdles because since you mentioned hurdles conservation would go quite quite a bit harder if people accepted the idea that conservation and development are both necessary but in different places they accepted the idea that we decouple from nature rather than extract from nature to protect nature so these are ideological battles so they are also hurdles 
So my final question for you today is that what career advice would you give upcoming conservationists? Depends on what your passion is. See, I got in because I didn't start saying I'm going to be a conservationist. I joined in because I wanted to watch animals. I wanted to watch tigers. I want to live with them, study them. So I think that passion has to be there. I think if it's just a cerebral idea that I want to be a conservationist, then I'm not saying it's wrong. It becomes a job rather than a passion. So I really don't know you enough to say what, why you got into this profession and what's your passion. So it's hard for me to individually advise people without knowing their true passion. So that was my final question for the interview. Thank you so much for your time. And that was the end of this episode of the Think Wildlife podcast. Please do subscribe and share if you enjoyed this episode. Also, the links to the uh, book Amongst Tigers is in the description below. So if interested, do get a copy.